If you will turn to about your third page over, this will be your blood work page. How many of you in here had your PSAs done? Prostatic specific antigen. Okay, very good. Your PSAs will be on the second page of your blood work. Your blood work, second page of the blood work page down at the bottom. You will see prostatic specific antigen, PSA. The prostatic specific antigen is approximately 93 to 95% effective in predicting early onset of prostate cancer. 93 to 95. The finger wave, which some of you know all about, the finger wave is only about 30 to 35 percent. And that's with a very good doc with a very large finger. Okay? But the best he can do is about a 30 to 35 percent. The blood test is the best way to handle PSAs. Anything below a 4.0, you know you're doing good on PSAs. 4.0 or below. Now you're going to hear this word quite often, and that is however. However on PSAs, if you jump 0.8 or more in one year, 0.8 or more in one year, you've got something going on in your PSA. This is not an old man's disease. The youngest male I've ever found with prostate cancer was 17. Gwinnett County, Georgia, 561 firefighters. 60 had prostate cancer, 29 were under the age of 40. It has replaced lung cancer. It is now the number one cancer in males. Early onset can be cured. If it metastasizes through the wall and into the lymph nodes, you can kiss your sex life goodbye. It's over with, and more than likely, it is terminal. Early onset is curable. You don't have to lose your sex life. You don't have to have a problem. It is curable without surgery. So remember, PSAs, if at any time you have the opportunity to have your PSA test done, take advantage of it. Anything below a 4.0, you're doing good. If you jump 0.8 or more in one year, you have a problem. 0.8, you might be 1.0, you jump to 1.9, it's still way below four, right? But you've got a problem. Any questions on PSAs? Okay, turn back over to your first page, please. I have a question. Yes, sir. You said that it was on the second page. Right, did you ask for it? Uh, no, I didn't. Okay, then you don't have it done. You had to ask for it at the blood work time and uh, for it to have been done. Let me see the mic and I'll answer that. The PSA was not included in the base physical that everyone had because that particular test is not a part of what would qualify you to do duty or not here at the fire department. <clears throat> there were some folks from other organizations that were having that done, and uh, when our folks saw that, they asked if they asked for it, could they get it? They were told yes. So uh, you could ask for it. It's an extra ten dollars, I think. It Eighteen. Was, Eighteen dollars during that process and had it done. It's not part of what would be necessary to test you for, to certify you for duty for structural firefighting is why it was not included in the Department of Physics. If, if we had thought about it and to make it voluntary earlier, we would probably let everybody know. We just didn't know, we didn't think about it. It's not part of what you need to certify you for duty. Next year we'll know better and it'll probably be available to everybody if you choose to have that done. Next year on the physicals, all you need to do is ask us and we'll take care of it. Our phlebotomist will mark it and it'll be in your blood work. And please take advantage of it. Uh, in the doc's office, it'll cost you anywhere from 65 to $165 for that. We charge 18 bucks. And that's what Laboratory Corporation charges us to do uh, PSAs. And because we're drawing blood at one time, we don't make anything off of it. Uh, we don't have to draw again. So it's all part and parcel if you want. Okay, over on the first page now. At the top of the page, you will see glucose. Glucose, of course, is the amount of sugar in the blood. I will give you up to about 120. And the reason I give the fire service up to about 120 versus your range of 109 
is because in the fire service, we have a lot of sandbaggers. If you go out on a call at 2 o'clock in the morning and you get back to the station at 4, more than likely, you're going to drink something and you may even eat something. So what I do is I give you a little bit more of a uh, leeway on your glucose. But if you're over 120, if you are over 120, you need to be definitely considering adult onset diabetes. Now directly below that, you'll see uric acid. Uric acid is the amount of, uh, uric acid is, accumulates in the joints. Once it accumulates in the joints, it starts crystallizing. This is your gout figure. This is the gout figure. Should be below 8.2. Heavy greens, collard greens, mustard greens, turnip greens, kale, spinach, causes an increase in your uric acid. Iced tea. And in the fire service, there's usually a half gallon plus in every firehouse of iced tea, especially starting this time of year. Everybody's got a big old gallon of iced tea. That's my iced tea, don't touch it. All right? That's the idea. All right? This is tea, and this is platoon number one. Lock the refrigerator, because I got the iced tea in there. Then shellfish. Shrimp, abalone, scallops, uh, oysters, all of these are shellfish. Can cause an increase in your uh, uric acid. Gout figure, uric acid. Directly below that, you'll see blood uric nitrogen. Then you'll see creatinine, blood uric nitrogen creatinine ratio. Then come down to where you see protein, albumin, globulin. These are all kidney function tests. These are your kidney function tests. If you are showing high or low, an H or an L beside any one of those, you need to get in to see your doc because more than likely you're having a kidney infection or you've got a kidney problem. Unless you're going into the gym and you're uh, taking creatinine. If you go into the gym and taking creatinine, more than likely your creatinine is going to be showing up. Come down, you see LDH. LDH, SGOT, SGBT, and GGT. These are all liver enzymes. These are your liver enzymes. But they also apply to your gallbladder. Your gallbladder, and they also apply to the pancreas. So they apply to all three. How can you tell if it is liver or gallbladder? First of all, you look in the mirror and say, am I a drinker? How much alcohol am I consuming? If you are not a drinker, that's eliminated. So at that point in time, you go out and eat a chili cheeseburger half and half, pour grease all over it. If it makes you sicker than a dog, it's your gallbladder. And that's the best way to tell between gallbladder and liver. Because if you can't eat high-fat diets, you've got a gallbladder problem. Now, how else do you tell? Gallbladder disease comes through the mama's side of the family. Grandma, mother, down through the family, and it is a genetical influence. So if mother had gallbladder disease, grandmother had gallbladder disease, you start not being able to eat high fat diets, guess what? You got gallbladder disease, all right? And the thing about it is it's arthroscopic now, they just go in, make one little incision and suck it out with a vacuum cleaner. And they take care of your gallbladder. But that's the best way to tell whether it's a gallbladder or whether it is a liver that's got the involvement. Now, go back up to you see sodium. You got sodium and then you have potassium. Now you have a cell. Inside the cell, and now this is bad graphics right here, but that's the best I could do real quick. You have a cell, and there are millions of cells in the body. Inside of the cell is potassium. Outside of the cell is sodium. If you become dehydrated, you lose your sodium from outside of the cell. It creates a vacuum. The potassium goes through the wall of the cell to fill the vacuum where the sodium has been lost, 
and that reduces, there is no potassium inside the cell, what is the cell going to do? You're going to cramp. Loss of potassium causes cramping. But the loss of potassium is caused by the loss of sodium. So when you replace potassium, the good thing is bananas and cantaloupe are the two best replacement items for the loss of potassium. So when you replace potassium, the potassium goes back into the cells. Why do you want to have hydrate with Gatorade, you want to stay hydrated? So you don't lose your sodium. But if you lose the sodium, then you will lose your potassium. The potassium will go through the wall to replace the sodium that is lost. Everybody understand that? Hydration, very important, especially in the fire service. This time of year, boots start filling up with water from sweat when you're in a big old fire. You know you're losing sodium. You know you're losing potassium. Down at the bottom, you will see iron. Now, iron is the oxygen transfer mechanism of the body. The bloodstream comes to the surface in the lungs. You breathe in oxygen. Oxygen attacks the CO2, kicks it out of the, off the train. The oxygen attaches itself to the uh, iron. The blood takes the iron around and deposits the oxygen in the cells of the body. The CO2 gets on the iron, the bloodstream comes to the surface, you blow off the CO2. Oxygen transfer. Now it's much more difficult to explain than that, all right? That's a simple way of understanding oxygen transfer. But that's what the iron does in the body. It is your oxygen transfer mechanism. Now come up to you see bilirubin, B-I-L-I-R-U-B-I-N. Bilirubin are the dead blood cells of the body. We make blood, we kill blood. We make blood, we kill blood cells. The bone marrow of the body is what produces the, bone, the uh, blood cells for the body, the bone marrow. If you lift weights, if you run, if you chop, if you work hard, if you dig a garden, when you use muscles, you break out and you break down blood cells, right? So you kill off blood cells. Bilirubin are the dead blood cells in the body. But the bilirubin and the iron go together. If you look at your blood work and you see high iron and you see high bilirubin, there is a disease called hemochromatosis, which is a breakdown of the blood cells by having too much iron in the body. That is about 90% genetics. That comes through the family. The treatment of choice for hemochromatosis is to bleed you. They take out your blood, they take out the iron, put the blood back. Do this about every two weeks. That's the treatment of choice, all right? Except in a little small fire department down in the lower part of the state of South Carolina, I found two young men, both with hemochromatosis, and just so happened that uh, mom and daddy and grandmom and granddaddy were cooking in iron pots, and the iron was seeping out of the pots into the food which caused hemochromatosis throughout the family. So there's another way to get it. Right? So your iron and your bilirubin go together. Now directly below your iron you will see total cholesterol. Total cholesterol should be below 200. Sugar, white flour, red meat, grease, dairy products five things and then over here one more that you shove down your throat and that's alcohol sugar and everybody's saying damn that's what i had for lunch okay <laughs> sugar white flour red meat grease dairy products that's my daily life all right but that's what causes from a dietary standpoint it causes increase in cholesterol but cholesterol increase 60 percent comes through genetics 60% is what mom and daddy, grandma and granddaddy gave you. 30% is diet, 10% comes from stress. So you can only do about 30% with your diet, below 200. Come down, do you see HDL cholesterol, high density lipoproteins? HDLs, these are the good boys. This is what cleanses veins and arteries should be above a 40, above 
four, zero. The only way a male can increase his HDL levels is through daily consistent aerobic activity. 30 to 50 minutes on your feet, on your seat, walk, bike, run, swim. Females change blood once a month. One week prior to their period, they'll be down somewhere around 18 to 25. Two weeks after their period, they're gonna be somewhere between 85 and 110. That's God's given built-in mechanism, gentlemen, by which you pay up your insurance policies, die young, and they spend your money. Because heart disease is almost non-evident in young, healthy females, all right? So remember, what you got, you got to increase. They just get it God's given built-in mechanism, just does it for them, all right? Walk, bike, run, swim, 30 to 50 minutes on your feet, on your seat should be above a 40 to have a cleansing effect. LDLs, the bad boys. Now this is what clogs veins and arteries. This is your clogging mechanism. Should be below 100. New research says, it's just coming out, says it should be below 90. I don't know how we ever gonna get there, all right? Except through medication. Total cholesterol below 200, HDL's above a 40, LDL's the bad boys below 100. Drugs of choice right now, the statin drugs, Lipitor, Zocor, Provocal, Protestal, Mevacor, all of these are statin drugs. This is what lowers cholesterol. This is the drug lowering effect. Directly under your total cholesterol, you will see triglycerides. Triglycerides are free floating fats in the blood. Free floating fats in the blood, called fat blood. You spin down an individual with high triglycerides and it looks like mayonnaise laced with blood. That's an ugly looking tube. Now get this, change in your range, gentlemen. Should be below 100, not 149. Should be below 100 triglycerides. That's the one change that you'll have in your ranges. Now, total cholesterol slash HDL ratio. This is what is one of the most important items. It's the ratio of your good to your total. Should be 4.3 or below. Sometimes you'll hear 4.6. 4.3 or below. 4.3 up to a 7, you know you can do that about something about it with your diet. If you are over a 7, you're developing heart disease as we speak. You need to get into your doc, you need to sit down, and you need to get on some medications today. If you're over a 7 on your ratio, you got some problems. Drugs of choice for cholesterol, the statin drugs. Drugs of choice for your triglycerides is Lopid, L-O-P-I-D. That's normally the drug of choice today. Some docs may have other things, but those are the drugs normally used. Any questions on this page? Yes, sir. What the elevation of triglycerides? What, what can you do? To it's sugar, alcohol, and grease. And 60% of that, 60% of your triglycerides is genetics. Mom and daddy, grandma and granddaddy. It is really 60%. If you're 300 on your triglycerides, 180 of that belongs to what you got through your lineage. So it, it's, a, it's a real tough, it's a real tough item. I have a captain in the police service who is, uh, runs about 650 on his triglycerides. He runs seven miles a day eats no red meat, does not drink alcohol, and doesn't eat sugar, and he still runs 650. But he, we've got him on medication, and he's down below 200 right now. But it's a tough, it's a tough item. It's genetics. Yes? So it's 60% genetic, 30% diet, 10%. Stress. The question out in the station was uh, the, uh, the figures about 60% is uh, genetics, 30% diet, 10% stress. 60% of cholesterol, 60% of triglycerides are genetics. 
really tough. I went from 158 to 177 to 197 to 211, 217. When I got to 221 on my cholesterol, I put myself on Lipitor because I just said I'm going to stop it. But I've got genetics. My mother died of a coronary event from atherosclerosis. Any questions else on this page? Yes, sir. Iron. How do we uh, regulate our iron? The regulation of iron is the question. Uh, you don't really regulate iron, per se. The thing, if you're showing high on your iron, uh, the question you want to ask yourself, am I taking a supplement? If, you're, if you are high, okay? Uh, if you're low, then uh, you've got some other things going on. It may be medical, because you may be bleeding somewhere and causing a drop in your iron. Uh, it may be that you do have a uh, iron deficiency type of uh, problem, anemia, and you might, uh, your doc might want to treat you for it. If you are high or low on your iron, just being a slightly high on your iron is nothing to be really concerned about. If your iron is high and your bilirubin is high, then you do want to get concerned. If you're low on your iron, you need to get in and have a little talk with your doc because something else may be going on medically within you. We had a question, a uh, call-in question, and asked if there were any natural remedies for lowering the cholesterol or triglyceride. I guess this is alternatives to the prescription medications. Uh, prescription medication is one way, but natural ways of lowering cholesterol uh, is diet. Sugar, white flour, red meat, greased dairy products. The next thing is cholesterol can be lowered by oat products. Oat products can lower your, trigly uh, your uh, cholesterols. Also, niacin. Niacin will lower your, tri your cholesterols. If you can take it, but it causes a flushing. It causes a flushing and itching effect. And it's, some people cannot even take niacin. Niacin will work. Also, garlic will work, all right? Garlic will lower your cholesterol levels. The best thing to lower it is exercise and monitor sugar, white flour, red meat, grease, and dairy products in your diet. That's the best way. I didn't say cut any of them out. I said monitor the amount that you're consuming. Yes, sir. How effective are omega-3 fatty acids prevention HDL? I didn't catch that. How, how effective are omega-3 fatty acids prevention They are excellent. They are excellent. Now, a lot of people also can't take the, uh, the omega-3, all right? A lot of people can't take the fish oil because that's what it is, it's fish oil. Well, they have the flaxseed too, right? I mean, right. Which is the best, fish oil be strong? Probably, but the thing about it is we are all different. It's according to what works for you. Some people, it doesn't work at all. And then other people, it does work. So you have to determine which one will work for you. If it works for you, do it because it's a whole lot better than taking the statin drugs. Uh, and it's something to try. Charles, can, it works can you repeat his question? Uh, it was because the, the guys in the station aren't hearing that, so they're getting a little confused with the responses. Okay. He is asked about uh, natural remedies for uh, lowering your cholesterols, right? The flexors and the, uh, the uh, fatty or omega-3 uh, uh, fish oils, right? The, these things can be, they can work for you. However, you have to determine within your own metabolic system what will work for you. Not everybody will. Oat, oat bran will work with a lot of people. I mean, it'll just drop it straight down. Also, niacin. Niacin will work. It'll drop it straight down. Uh, there are a lot of things that will work, but you've got to determine if it does work for you. If it does, use it. That's the thing about it, is use it. Uh, the good thing is, is you do have natural remedies if they will work for you. If they won't, the statin drugs are available out there to you. Just so happened with my uh, metabolic system, I had to go on Lipitor. All this other lowered me some, but it didn't drop me down enough to where it dropped me below the 200. But I'm on Lipitor and I stay at 158 now continuously. Yeah, did that lower your good cholesterol too? No. But I ride 200, 250 miles a week on a bicycle. So my HDLs run about 58. They stay up. 
mainly because the amount of aerobic activity that I do. But that's not saying for everybody. It's just so happened with me, my, uh, my HDL stayed up. And statins do raise your HDL levels. Statin drugs will raise your HDLs. And omega-3s will also, very definitely. If you can take it, a lot of people don't like to smell like fish. And you will have a skin odor sometimes if you take the fish oil. Any other questions that we may have on uh, cholesterols? Now triglycerides. The best way to reduce triglycerides, which was your other question, is through daily consistent aerobic activity. Because don't forget, it is the amount of sugar in the blood, okay? Sugar is transferred into triglycerides. And the first thing that you burn, first 20 to 30 minutes of exercise, you burn glucose, you burn sugar. So to reduce triglyceride levels, you can reduce triglyceride levels by aerobic activity. Walk, bike, run, swim. That's the, that's the very best way to reduce your triglyceride levels. It's a good exercise program. All right, any questions on this page? Turn the page for me. The next page, at the top of the next page, you will see your thyroids. Thyroid sensitive hormone, TSH, T4, T3, free thyroxin index. These are all your thyroids. Now your thyroid is a gland that sits in the throat. The thyroid gland controls two glands. One is on top of the one kidney, the other one is on top of the other kidney. These are the adrenal glands. They produce the adrenaline for the body. The fight, the flight, the excitement, jacked up, get going, all right? Thyroid adrenaline. Now, too much thyroid, what's gonna happen? It's gonna increase your heart rate. Too much thyroid is gonna cause what is known as thyroid storm. Thyroid storm and the heart starts paying the price for too much thyroid. But too little thyroid, you start slowing way down. And all of a sudden you start gaining weight, all right? I have a 300-pound uh, brother, and my 300-pound brother now they found out has got thyroid disease. But it is, comes down through mama, grandmama. It comes down through the mother's side of the family. And in some instances, it will jump a generation. Your mother may have it, you don't have it, your uh, brothers and sisters don't have it, but yet then you have a child that does to develop thyroid disease. Uh, right above the lake down here in Charlotte, uh, fire department down there, I found five young people under the age of 35 with thyroid disease. They didn't even know they had it. They're all, all on medication, and I tested them this past, right before Christmas and uh, they're all doing great. But thyroid disease comes down mama's side of the family. But it is controls the adrenal glands. That's why it's so important. And, include, and it, it controls the adrenaline for the body. Below that, you will see white blood cells. White blood cell count. These are the police officers of the body. You get a cold, you get a fever. You get a viral infection, a bacterial infection, you cut your hand. White blood cells go out and they go up to corral the bad guys. Then as you start getting over this infection, your body has to rid itself of the bad guys. And if you look down at the bottom quarter of the page, you will see lymphs, L-Y-M-P-S. Your lymph system, your lymph system is what rids the body of the bad guys. That's your jail system of the body. So you get a cold, white blood cell counts up. As you get over the cold, lymph system goes up. They work in conjunction with one another. People who've had cancer, cancer surgery, why do they remove the lymph nodes? Because they're looking for the cancer cells that may have metastasized into the lymph system because the system, lymph system, rids, tries to rid the body of the bad guys, okay? That's how they know if it has metastasized. Below that, you will see white blood cell count, 
that you see red blood cell count, hemoglobin, hematocrit. Hemoglobin is the amount of solids in the blood. Hematocrit is the amount of serum or fluid in the blood. You become dehydrated. What's going to happen? Your hemoglobin is going up. Your hematocrit, which is the serum, is going down. Because they work in conjunction with one another. Directly below that, you'll see MCVs, MCHs, MCHCs, and RDW. These are all minute little enzymes in the blood. It's like some of you that have ever read the Bible. You don't take verses out of context. Like all of your uh, Islamic uh, terrorists, they take these one little statements out of context. There are other things in your body has to be going on for these to become meaningful. If you eat hot spicy food, they will go up. You drink a beer, they will go up. You eat Mexican food, you eat Italian food, you eat Thai food, they just go up and down, all right? By themselves, they don't mean anything. Other things have to be going on for them to become meaningful to you. But now directly below your RDW, you will see platelets. Now I want everybody that has a packet in here, find your platelets. This is the most important item on this page. All blood dysphagias, leukemias, lymphomas, bone cancers, every, all of these start right here with your platelet counts. Leukemia. We tested an assistant chief last February, a year ago. He was great. June, he started feeling really, really bad. Went into his doc. He did a platelet count on him. He was zero. He died of leukemia last October. That's how quick it moved on him. Also in the fire service, there are two areas which you should be very cognizant of in your blood work. And that is your platelet counts and your liver enzymes. Because whenever you go into a fire situation, you never know what's burning. And if it's going to affect you, if there's something that's going to affect your health, will show in these two areas first, your liver enzymes and your platelets. So when you get your blood work back, the two areas that you look at first, very first, are your platelets and then look at your liver enzymes. Pay attention to those two items. It's very important. We had a fire department with a platoon that went into a fire. <clears throat> they came out, all of them got sick. We did blood work on them, and their liver enzymes were out of sight, and the platelet counts dropped. We could not identify why it happened. We knew it was going on. About three weeks later, they were all back to normal. But we worked on it for three solid weeks trying to figure out what was causing this problem with this one platoon after it had been into this one fire. So anytime you go in, anytime you have your blood work done, pay attention to your platelet counts, and pay attention to your liver enzymes. Very important. What kind of symptoms would have you said they got sick? Flu, flu-like symptoms. They started feeling really bad. They were really worn down. They were running a low-grade fever. Uh, they had chills, the whole nine yards. And no one was ever able to identify the substance that they, that, uh, that they got into. It was an, a small apartment fire. And they weren't in that long. They took care of it very quickly, but something something was burning in that apartment that caused this problem. We were never able to identify it. We were, but they all are well. In other words, they have had no uh, residual effect from it. It just happened. So anytime you have your blood work done, pay attention, guys, to those two areas: liver enzymes and your platelet counts. Very, very important for you. All right, below that, you will see monocytes. Then you see polys. Then you'll see basophils, B-A-S-O. Then you'll see eosinophils, E-O-S's. Monocytes, mononucleosis. Polys, polycythemia. And then your basophils and your eosinophils are allergic reactions. This time of year, the pollen, the, uh, all of your allergies start coming about. And if you're elevated on your basophils or you're elevated on your eosinophils, more than likely, you have some pollen reaction or you've got some reaction to some type of uh, weed or something this time of year. So that's what those are about. Monocytes 
and polys, the doc, you go in with a sore throat, you go in with an earache, cold, bad, feel bad. If he pulls blood, he looks at these things to determine what it is that is causing your problem. That's what those are used for. Any questions on this page? Any questions on your blood work page? All right, turn over to you about your 10th page over and it will say coronary risk report. Coronary risk report. At the bottom of the page, you will see black line going across the page. There will be a word current, and next to the current you'll see a number. The higher that number, the better that number. And then on the far right hand side of the page you will see a verbiage. And it will say average, good, poor, fair, pathetic. It'll give you some kind of terminology of where you are, okay? Top of the page, you will see systolic blood pressure. Systolic blood pressure is the amount of pressure in the hose when the pump is turned on. Should be 140 or below. The lower the better. Diastolic blood pressure. How much pressure is in the hose when the pump is turned off? Should be 90 or below. The lower the better. The basic reason why we find high blood pressure in young healthy males is the lack of rest. In the fire service, a lot of guys, 24 on, 48 off, they work, they work two jobs, some of them work three. The most I've seen is a guy that works six jobs. All right? They don't rest. Rest is something that you get when, you, when you're doing the long dirt nap, right? And so they don't rest much. When you start seeing your blood pressure go up, pay attention to how much rest that you are getting. Now. Total cholesterol below 200, HDLs above a 40, LDLs below 100, triglycerides below 100, glucose something below 120. All right, the number one health problem that we find throughout the fire service, seven states, is the use of tobacco. Smoke or chew. Mainly smoking. That is the number one health problem that we find. Period. 18,000 people. That is it. Any questions on this page? Turn the page for me. Pulmonary function. <clears throat> and now guys, this page right here is the most important item that you deal with in the fire service. All three OSHA regulations, 1910-156, 1910-120, the hazmat reg, 1910-134, your air pack, respiratory reg, falls right here on this pulmonary function test. Pulmonary function testing doesn't say if there's any disease entity present. It says, do you have any obstructions or restrictions to keep you from taking in air or expelling air? At the top of the page, you'll see forced vital capacity, FBC. Come down on the left-hand side of the page and it says your current value is, the current value should be above 70%. Directly below that, you'll see forced expiratory volume, one second. The amount of air you got out of your lungs in one second. Come down on the left-hand side, the current value is. That current value should also be above 70%. Then at the bottom of the page, you see a comparison between the FEV1 and the FBC. Under current, C-U-R-R-E-N-T, current should be also above 70%. Now, since you've all had the test, now I'll tell you how to take this test and pass it every time. All pulmonary function machines are built on a six-second calibration, six-second basis. Never take a pulmonary function test sitting down. And all of you sitting there, hey, I was sitting down when I took that thing. All right, the way you do it, 
you take a real deep breath, you insert that mouthpiece as far back in your mouth as you can get it. Most males, most males do not like to take a pulmonary function test because they don't like that mouthpiece. They say it right here on the middle of the and it's as far out of their lips as they can get it. Wrong. You want to put it as far back in that mouth as you can. Hold your nose with the opposite hand and explode downward. And as you blow, go down. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six will be approximately waist high. Stop, hand the machine to the technician, and you will have passed that test every single time. If you go less than six seconds, it's not going to record it. You go over six seconds and you lose a little bit. The way you pass it is standing up, inserting that mouthpiece as far back as you can, and explode downward. Right? That test, that test right there, is the test to control your destiny as a professional firefighter. This test right here can disqualify you faster in the fire service than any other test that you can do. This is the big boy. Pulmonary function testing. Any questions? Turn the page. Next page, over. Body comps. Now, I really don't get upset about body comps. A lot of guys get all blown out about body comps. It's where your clothes fit you the best, where you feel like you feel the best, and where you want to be more than anything than what we can give you. If you get up on Monday morning, you take a shower, and you step out, and you look in the mirror and jump up and down, if everything's moving all around, you know you got some overfat. That's just the best way to tell it. You say, God, all right, I got to do something about it. Diets start on Mondays. There's not a diet in the world that never starts on a Saturday. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and by Thursday, you're kicking the dog and biting the cat. Friday, you go on the way home, you stop by and pick up two six-packs, six steaks, 10-pound bag of potatoes, four loaves of bread, and you go home and eat the whole thing. Sunday night, you can suck Oreo cookies out of a bag through a garden hose at 100 yards, because Sunday nights are the hungriest time that you ever get. I can't explain that. I don't know why I get hungry on Sunday nights. Everybody else does. Monday morning, you take a shower and go, oh, shit, got to get rid of this. <laughs> All right. That's what happened. <coughs> now then, sugar, white flour, red meat, grease, dairy products, and alcohol. Five things. How many, for, how many prongs on a fork? Unless it's a French fork. There are four. Sugar, white flour, red meat, grease, dairy products. Most of that is milk type products, all right? So you got four things on the end of that fork. You can have one of those once a day for a week. One of them. Okay? And then you can't have any more. That's how you want to think about a diet. You don't cut anything out of your diet. That never works. We are being born and raised in the South. If it ain't cooked in fat, and if it ain't fried, it's not any good. Okay? If it grows out of the ground, I might eat it because mama made me. But it don't necessarily taste good. Right? Fried chicken, red meat, go through it. Mayonnaise, butter, right? sugar, white flour, red meat, grease, dairy products, five things. <coughs> and alcohol. You don't cut anything out of your diet. You just reduce the amount that you're eating is how you want to diet. If you've got overfat, you're trying to lose overfat, that's the way to work. Males would like to see between 18 and 20, uh, excuse me, between 14 and 18% body fat for males, females between 18 and 23% body fat. 18 to 23. The big thing in, in body fat measurements, the exercise physiologists in this clinic, we use calipers, we're within 7 to 10 percent, plus or minus. 7 to 10 percent. You have to have 4 percent in your body just to hold your organs in. 4 percent just to hold your organs. 
Any questions on body comps? Turn to page. Now, this page is aerobic capacity. Now, I care a great deal about this page. Aerobic capacity is the ability of your body to utilize oxygen. Oxygen utilization. The ability of your body to utilize oxygen. You'll see long black lines or short black lines on your page. Directly underneath it, you'll see summary. It says your aerobic capacity is so many milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of body weight per minute, ml slash kg slash min. <clears throat> Lance Armstrong won the Tour de France. Lance Armstrong's aerobic capacity is 87.5. Phenomenal. Your National Fire Academy says you should be between 42 and 44 milliliters of oxygen per kilogram body weight per minute. To participate in the combat challenge, you should, uh, Dr. Davis says that you should be 45 or above. Three academic research, three, University of Wisconsin, University of Michigan, Penn State University, all three have said you should be 33.5 or above. 33.5 milliliters of oxygen per kilogram body weight per minute. Now, if you're not 33.5, you're not as good as a pregnant lactating mother. <laughs> because pregnant lactating mothers are above 33.5. I didn't mean to hurt your feelings, but that was a true statement. All right? National class athletes, college athletes, are above a 60. International athletes, your Olympic athletes, are above a 70. 60 and 70. Any questions on aerobic capacity? Now, if you're not above 33.5, how do you get there? Turn two pages. Those of you that have been referred to your physician and have copies of all of your work in the back will not have exercise prescriptions. Those of you that have not, you will have an exercise prescription in your packet. All of you will have a walking prescription. Uh, some of you will have a jogging prescription. And then some of you will may even have a treadmill, stationary bicycle, or if you ask for it, you will have, you will have a, uh, swimming prescription. You read all of these prescriptions exactly the same way. There are 12 weeks down the side of your page. 12 weeks down. There are seven days across the top. We suggest you do between four and seven days a week. If you do what we tell you to do, you will not get hurt. Now some of you are already exercising. Those of you that are exercising will start at the level where you are on this exercise prescription. If you are already covering 3.2 miles, then that's where you will start on your exercise prescriptions. Covering X amount of distance and X amount of time. Any questions on exercise prescriptions? Any questions on this packet? Blood work, coronary risk, pulmonary function, body comp, aerobic capacity, exercise prescriptions. In between all of this is a lot of generic information. Take it, spend the time to read it. Those of you that have a significant other, that significant other, if they get hold of this packet, they will become interested in it, I promise. Because the significant others, they love this kind of stuff, especially if it applies to you. <laughs> they don't like to talk about themselves, but they love to get hold of it if it applies to you, right? If you have a walking prescription, I suggest that you might take the time with that significant other and go for a long walk. That's the best time in the world to get reacquainted with whatever that significant other is because uh, there isn't a woman in the world that doesn't like to walk. Some reason, walking is wonderful to the females, right? 
They love to go out there. That's a good time to go out for a long walk, spend the time. Any questions? Anything that I can answer for you? Thank you very much.